Welcome to the Equestrian Perspective Podcast. I'm Felicity Davies and I'm here to simplify horse training and teach you absolutely everything you need to know about how to build both your own and your horse's confidence levels, form an amazing relationship together and feel empowered in any environment. And on this podcast, I'll be sharing my best advice, trainings and mindset shifts so you can truly connect with your horse and pursue your goals in a way that feels good for both of you. So get ready to embark on a new equestrian perspective and I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to the Equestrian Perspective podcast and today I'm very excited to have with me Amy Skinner from Amy Skinner Horsemanship. And I've been following Amy for quite a long time and I really enjoy the posts that she shares and I resonate with a lot of the content that she shares and the things that she talks about. So I'm really excited to dive into her journey and hear a bit more about her training philosophy. So welcome to the podcast, Amy. And can you please uh, give everyone a little brief introduction as to who you are, where you're from and what you currently do with horses? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, So I have been training for the public about 10 years, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, It turns out I keep aging and (laughs) I have to keep track of time. Um, So I primarily right now do rehabilitation, what I call postural rehabilitation Mm -hmm. um, and also behavioral rehabilitation. And so what that means is that I focus on horses who have um, dysfunctional movement patterns, pain patterns, um, behavioral patterns that usually come with that. Um, so I take a horse who is in some type of issue and Mm -hmm. discomfort, and I sort of break apart all of the pieces of his life that aren't working for him. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason I do that is I used to do regular training and I would find like, I would get a horse in training to do flying changes on or something. And I would find that in there, there was some physical problem that I couldn't get to the heart of because the client expected me to do a flying change. Um, so there were all these things that I had to just muck through. So now I only do, um, young horses and rehabs. And so that means that I'm very involved with my body workers, my dentists, my, uh, hoof care professionals, um, my vets, and we basically take apart the whole horse's life and piece it back together in a way that fits. Mm, cool. Very cool. Yeah. And I love that collaborative approach of just going, okay, let's tease it all apart and bring it back together. And if you're working with people, I guess, with young horses or horses that need, rehabilitating um yeah then I guess people the clients are very open-minded in the fact of going let's just do whatever we need to (laughs) yeah so usually people by the time they're bringing me a rehab or at the end of their rope and they're like please just fix it (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. it's a really it's sad that they need to be that way but it's a really nice position for me to be in because I can really help the horse with everything that I know yeah 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 definitely and with a young horse, it's like, let's not mess this horse up in the first place. And here's all the things that I know how to head all this off. And usually people are really pleased with the result, but, um, yeah. I, I do things. I take a little bit longer than average for starting a young horse. And that's why, because I'm going all of those same routes and eliminating any potential problems. Yeah, definitely. Oh, there's so many tangents I could go into now, but I will brace myself. Yeah. <laughs> okay well let's just start by let's go into a bit of an overview of your journey with horses so we can figure out how this all came together um but how old were you when you started riding when did you get your first horse how did that all come about well I was uh six when I started riding um mm-hmm. and my journey has been this kind of twisty little loop de do. um so I'm from a military family we moved a lot and so when I was uh six years old we lived in um, Caracas Venezuela and I wanted to ride very badly so we went to the military riding school there and I learned to ride jumpers Mm -hmm. so I was riding huge thoroughbreds um jumping I think three feet was about as high as I got to before I got scared um And so I did that, but we moved around a lot. Every time we moved, we went to whatever the barn that I could get access to was. So I did a little bit of everything. I did barrel racing. I did jumpers. I did hunter jumper. I did some dressage. I did trail riding. I did who knows what this lady's teaching, but I'm going around in circles. (laughs) You know, it's just a little taste of everything. So I I didn't really get, I would say like a strong foundation in any one discipline. Yeah. Um, But I did get a lot of experience with a lot of different kinds of horses. Mm. Um, and then as I got older and moved out, I started volunteering and working in barns and working off lessons and started riding like school ponies and, you know, um, helping out with the, the lesson programs and stuff. And I started to really 
somehow get involved just by f- being there at the right time at the right place with the school ponies who were having trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, like there would be some that would bolt with the kids or they wouldn't stand still at the block or they were scared on the trail. And I would always get tossed on those. Um, I didn't know anything about training. I just stuck it out well enough because I was young, and dumb, and <laughs> we really enjoyed it. And so I started to realize that I really enjoyed doing that. And then I started to actually seek out training mm-hmm. um, to continue that because I really wanted to be a horse trainer. So um, I started doing clinics. Uh, I initially started doing clinics with Buck Branneman and folks like that. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and then as I learned more, I started to become very interested in classical dressage just because we had a clinician come through the barn that I worked at who was doing things that I'd never seen anyone so, so gentle or soft as her. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I started to, I think, evolve beyond the Buck Brandeman's type of work into more of a classical approach and really enjoyed that. Um, mm-hmm. And so I would say that's where my main focus is now. And that's where I learned a lot of my rehabilitation and, and postural rehab work is through classical, the classical approach of developing a horse. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, as for getting my first horse, I did not get my first horse till I was 24. Yeah. Um, I got my first horse when I was 24 and I still have her now. Um, I wrote about her in both my books, I think. So mm-hmm. if you want to get to know her, her name's Dee. Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And who was the clinician that was doing the classical dressage that you first saw that you were like, wow, she's so soft? Um, her name is Teresa Doherty. So she is a longtime student of Walter Zettel and Egon von Neindorf. Mm-hmm. Uh, she studied in Germany for over 20 years. Um, mm-hmm. I know that a lot of people don't equate dressage with softness, but she has the very old, very, very strictly classical uh, mm. ways that Walter Zettel, if you watch him teach, he was like that too. He was so gentle and so horse focused that it just swept me away. I was so interested in it. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So that's that in a nutshell. And that brings you to this point now where you're working with the young horses and the rehab mm-hmm. horses. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So let's pivot into, I, I reckon I might dive into one of the questions I had earlier when you were talking about taking a longer time to start the young horses. Do you want to talk to us about your philosophy behind that? Because I know there's like, I just look at the standard. If you send your horse away to someone for six to 12 weeks and get them started on the saddle to me, I couldn't do that. And I feel like that's very much a flooding approach, especially if the horse Mm -hmm. hasn't had any handling before. Um, and I have an inclination that you're on a similar wavelength, but let's hear your. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, I actually decided that I hated that approach after I had been doing it for years. Um, yeah. So I, I wanted badly to be a horse trainer and I was so excited to be allowed to be brought horses by people. They were bringing me horses and I felt like I had to do a really good job and yeah. everyone around me was doing 30 days. And so I, wanted to keep clients, wanted to do a good job. And so in order to get 30 days on these horses, I found myself stressed and rushing and I was trying my best to be, um, ethical in my approach to the horse, but also didn't want to lose business. And so I found myself way overloading horses. Um, and then, you know, I, I worked for someone for a short time who was like, you know, we got to pump these horses out in 30 days. Cause we're competing mm-hmm. with Jim Bob and Joe Bob all next door. Um, so 30, after 30 days, they'd better be walk, trot, canner out on the trail, roping a calf, all this stuff. So I was just, it was so much pressure. The horses were so overloaded. Everybody was stressed. And even if I could ride them and make them look cool, they would often go home and buck off their owner or buck me off a handful of times. And so I just, when I left that job, decided I was never doing that again. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I went to 60 days and I was like, that's not nearly enough. Then I went to 90 days and I was like, no, 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 that's not even enough. And so now I'm at six months and I'm like, I'm really happy with the horses I'm sending home. Mm -hmm. Um, I get a lot less young horses to start, but I at least sleep at night and feel better and don't worry about my babies that I send home because they are like your own babies. Like you take care of them for a long time. You know them. You're the first one that's ever sat on them. You care about their mouth. You care about their sides. You care about their back. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just kills me to watch them go home and get, you know, scared and worried and not have enough support. Yeah, definitely. And 
Okay. So what I find really interesting about that whole piece is the first thing you mentioned was talking about, okay, initially you felt the pressure of, and trainers around you felt the pressure of, okay, we need to do it in this way because everyone else is doing it in this way and we want to maintain clients. But I think the really cool thing about what you're sharing is if everyone's doing something the same, there's going to be people out there that want something different right Mm -hmm. so now you're in this period where you are attracting a different type of client because they are the types of client that don't agree with the 30-day model um, Mm -hmm. or don't want that for their horse and now they're willing to kind of invest in the six-month model and make that work for them which I think is a really cool thing for people to be um, aware of because I think that's just something that it's easy to get stuck in the trap of need to do it this way because everyone else is doing it this way Um, and it's like perhaps you need to do what feels right for you and then attract those clients to you, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I felt in the beginning when I first started that I really had to go the way the industry standard was set if I wanted to get work. Yeah. Um, and then I, I had this realization that, because I remember talking to the guy I worked for and he said, you know, I don't like it either, but that's what we have to do if we want to keep mm-hmm. work. And I remember thinking like, why do we keep offering it if it isn't good? You know, why do we all contribute to this if it's bad for the horse? And so I just had this realization that like, I would rather clean toilets for the rest of my life than scare one more young horse or flood one more young horse. And, um, I'm not proud of a lot of the young horses that I started, but, um, now I at least have the chance to be, because I feel like it's our duty as trainers to tell people what's right and offer only what's right and not offer what's not good for the horse. It's like, it's not even on my, that's why I only do young horses and rehabs because I don't even offer a service that I'm not proud of. Yeah. I love that. And I think that speaks really highly of the integrity that you have behind your work. And like you said, maybe in the past, you aren't super proud of what you were doing, but that was just a learning curve that you had to go through to Mm -hmm. kind of get to this point and stand behind these are my offerings. This is what I can do. And this is why I do it in this way and educate the owners. And if they're not on the same page as you, then they're not the right person for you either. Um, yeah, so yeah. That's really, really powerful to get behind. Okay. So that's the strategy with the young horses. And do you want to go a bit deeper into why you take the six months? Like how often you like to work with the horses um, sure. and things like that? Yeah. So, um, a lot of times with the young horses, they haven't had a lot of experiences in their life off their property. Mm -hmm. They, I just assume they don't know much, um, or worse, they've been handled a lot and it's not been good handling either way. We're kind of at a disadvantage with starting. So when they come to my property, I assume it's going to take a solid 30 days for them to just settle in, to figure out how to fit into a new herd. Um, not everybody has a whole herd of horses. Some people just have two, you know, or they've never been off the property. So, Mm -hmm. Um, getting them just settled in and just comfortable. And Mm -hmm. in those 30 days, I'm doing groundwork. I'm getting them accustomed to being handled if they aren't handleable um, or teaching them how to be handled in a way that's a little softer if they're used to being pulled on a lot. Yeah. Because a lot of, a lot of hand raised babies are very heavy and very kind of pushy. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's what I usually think of as the first 30 days is just Mm -hmm. getting their mind in a place that's a productive place to be and starting to get them settled in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then by the end of that time frame, I'm starting to, to graduate more into in hand work where mm-hmm. they're starting to learn, um, carrying postures. They're starting to learn how to use their back and their hind legs and, um, be a little more free in the shoulders. They're starting to learn to maybe carry a saddle when they do it. They're starting to wear maybe a bridle when they do that, but I'm not touching the bit yet. Um, and then I think it takes at least another 30 days to start to develop the muscle tone Mm -hmm. that is what I would consider safe for me to sit on. Um, and so in around the two to three month period, I'm starting to lightly back them. And the first couple rides, what I like to do, if I have the help is have uh, an assistant do in-hand work with me on them, or I do the in-hand with an assistant on them. So they're already familiar with the posture and they're just carrying weight. And the first ride is very friendly. It's just, Mm -hmm. I'm up here, even on both sides. I'm not interfering at all with your balance. There's nothing to worry about. You can carry me Um, because the way I used to do it is I would get on and ride them solo and try to make them go. And they'd be so scared that they couldn't move. And then when they'd move, my weight would shift and that would stop them. And so you'd really have to make them go and they'd go very tense. So their first experience with a rider was a tense back. And so now I've just find that layering it in one thing after another, after another makes them so relaxed. And I haven't had a young horse buck in over five years. 
Whereas yeah. I used to, they was to always book the first, second, third ride, you know, it's just the way I expected it. Mm-hmm. So then I, I always start them in the halter. Um, they might carry the bit, but I don't pull, I don't pick up reins until they're very clear mm-hmm. on the steering. Um, and then I just slowly start to graduate them. I walk them for a little bit and we might walk trot. Um, I usually don't canter for a little while unless they offer to canter. I might go with them, but I don't push the canter. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I do take them on field trips to trail rides and things like that. And I try to get them exposed in that time frame to as much as I can, but by the time they go home, most people tell me that they're the straightest horse they've ever sat on, mm-hmm. which is exciting and a little sad that people aren't used to experiencing a straight horse, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're usually very soft. They're usually very balanced. Um, and they usually feel a lot straighter than most horses that they're used to, even yeah. though they're very green. Yeah. Yeah. That just like, to me, that whole process just makes sense, like logical sense, right? Because it's very boring. Yeah, it's extremely boring. But it's I, I feel that. But very, I, yeah, I like boring. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> boring is good. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, I think just the fact of like letting them settle in, like so many places, mm-hmm. like with your thirty days, the the opposite to that would be you're on them within a week potentially, like that. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. So I think it just, it it makes a lot of sense. And it's just opening people's eyes up to, I guess, training in that longer format and realizing the investment that that is actually going to give them in the long run, rather than just looking at the financial number in front of them. Yeah. 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 And I realize it's very expensive. Six months for training is, is not anything to, to bat your eyes out. But, um, my assumption is if you're, if you care about your young horse, you've made plans to invest in his lifetime of soundness and training. Um, Mm -hmm. and hopefully you haven't got in a emotional purchase of a young horse or, you know, a quick, exciting, like I had to have this young horse purchase because those, those types of purchases don't often work out well for the horse. Yeah. And if you're in them, then it's time to make plans for your horse's well being. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, and Okay. I'm trying to think. Okay. Let's pivot into the rehab side of things. So can you talk to us a little bit about your philosophy with the rehab horses and maybe some exercises that you like to use or some really common things that you see, um, that you get where I'm going here. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, um, rehab's kind of a tricky name for it because most people think of rehab after something is broken. Like my horse has had surgery or a ligament or a tendon is ruptured or uh, something mm-hmm. terrible has gone wrong. And mm-hmm. I, I do do those, but I really hope to have the rehab before they're terribly broken. Mm-hmm. So um, what I do a lot of is postural rehab before the horse is quote unquote lame, where mm-hmm. they're serviceably sound, where they're just not quite right. They're not doing their best. And there's, it's hard to identify what's exactly wrong with this horse. Mm-hmm. So. I would say that the most common form of serviceably sound, but not quite sound horse is one that's developed dysfunctional tension patterns over time. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually, so you can, you can, you can go all the way back to when that horse was started. Somebody sat down on a horse's weak mid back, the horse dropped their back, started getting tense and they've carried that all the way up to, so now they're 12, 13, 14. They're starting to wear out. They're very tight in the forehand. They're very tight in the neck. They're very dropped in the back. Their pelvis is rotated down. Their hind legs are trailing up behind them. They've got crookedness everywhere. And they're just about to the point after all these years where they just can't keep going. Maybe all the rider feels is that, you know, when I kick and kick and kick, this horse just won't go or his canter feels terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, So where I come in is I look at this horse and I look at his body as a whole and I say, how have his feet shaped from this type of wear? And how can we help get his feet balanced to carry his body in a little balance? Uh, How can I find from nose to tail a way to eliminate these tension patterns and free up the parts that are tight? So that's the first thing I do is I look at what's tight, what's in the way. So I think of the horse as like a big hose with a kink, bunch of kinks in it. And my job is to go in and unkink those kinks. So the neck is really, really tight. We've got to loosen the neck. We've got to loosen the shoulders. We've got to free up the back. Then we can start to align the pelvis. And I do that with a series of, um, ground in hand exercises, things like pole work, um, in hand work is specifically targeted for that. Uh, things like getting them into a rhythmic walk and trot, um, Mm -hmm things that allow the body to start to free up. I think the easiest way to describe it is kind of like horsey yoga. You find what is not in alignment and help it loosen up so that the whole hose is now free to pass energy back to front. So now in theory, you have a horse that's very weak, but in alignment. 
So nothing is tying him up anymore, but he's not strong enough to maintain any kind of carrying posture. So now we're in a position where I can start to uh, teach him to carry a little bit more on his hindquarters. And that's again, where in hand work comes in teaching him lateral movements, things like leg yield, shoulder in, um, hill work, um, and then changing of gates, like, um, uh, walk trot transitions. Um, usually at this point, I'm not often cantering because so many of them have had such dysfunctional issues with their pelvis that mm-hmm. that might be like for a colt, we might be, but for a, a rehab horse, we might not be. It totally depends, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is where they're starting to develop a little more carrying power. Usually their coat, and I should have mentioned that I also completely restructure their nutritional program. Um, so they're getting a mineral specifically tested for my area. I eliminate all grain. Um, they're getting vitamin E they're getting good protein, good fats. Um, so they start to look really shiny at this point, looking beautiful. The owners are coming out and like, this is not the horse that I know. He's so happy. He's so vibrant. He's not like, cause usually when they come in, they have a list of descriptions for their horse that are actually not describing the personality of the horse. They're describing the symptoms of the horse. So they're calling him like pushy, or he doesn't really listen, or he's kind of dull or he's slow or he's lazy. And all of these things are like describing somebody in a hospital bed. Like, of course I'm not at my best when I'm, you know, sometimes I'm I'm shocked that these horses are even upright when I start to really delve into what they're dealing with. Um, So at this point, the horse is looking and feeling amazing. And then I start to reintegrate the horse and person together and teach the person now how to ride this horse. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's where it's a little tricky because the horse is not the horse they've ever seen before. It's new. I mean, he's, he needs you to not kick him. You can't pull him because he's, he's alive. Now you have to direct him. Yeah. I really enjoy that process. Yeah. No. And it makes complete sense. You're just isolating every single thing and you're just working out, okay, which pieces need to be kind of um, looked at and addressed mm-hmm. and create some new neural pathways so that the horse can move yes. in an optimal way and then piece all those things together before you add in the next layer, which is a rider and then their owner. So what's your process behind, because I'm like you just mentioned with the, with the rider, they've got some old habits and they're, they're used mm-hmm. to riding the, the old version of that horse. Um, what's your process behind teaching the owner how to, um, I guess, create the new neural pathways themselves so that they can ride this new version of their horse. Yeah. That's the toughest part actually, because uh, muscle matter, muscle memories die hard. You know, we, uh, where we get very set in our patterns, just like the horses do. So the first thing that I usually do is I, I will lead the owner around on their horse and not let them touch the reins or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will start introducing them to beginning to feel the horse's body part under their seat mm-hmm. because most people, when they're riding a very tight horse are not even aware of their seat because the horse's back has locked them out. And so the rider locks their back against the horse's back and the horse back locks against the rider. And they're just kind of bumping against each other. So mm-hmm. they've got to sort of learn to melt their seat onto this new horse's back that they've never felt. And so I start calling out where their front legs are and teaching them how to feel that in their body. And then their belly swinging side to side and their neck moving up and down and um, and then their hips and how they're going down and um, when the hind feet are weight bearing, listening to their breathing and, you know, feeling the breathing in their calves. And sometimes they're like shocked that they've never even thought of all of this stuff. Um, and I start getting riders really focused on that as soon as I can, because if I can get them just thinking about that as part of their new, uh, new muscle memory, then their hands are quieter and their legs are quieter. And the horse is usually much more free under them. And they don't have to worry so much about controlling the horse and trying to make the horse do all these things. Yeah. Yeah. And how long would some, like, obviously it depends on the person, but how long would that process take for some people? You know, it depends so wildly on the person because, you know, I would say like, imagine you have the most dedicated student and their body has some bad patterns, but they're really, really open to it. Yeah. And they take a lesson once a week that can go three to six months, best case scenario. But Mm -hmm. say you have somebody who has never heard what I'm saying before and wants to get it, but they just can't get their head around it because it's so opposite of what they've always learned. Mm -hmm. We're in like a three month period of at least just trying to get to like from negative 10 to zero where they can even get their head around it. Mm -hmm. And then their body won't listen to them. And they really have hands that clutch or legs that squeeze. And so I've had people that it's taken years. Um, and it's not for lack of trying. It's just, I, I know that when I tell people something, I get the look in their face that they like, that's the opposite of everything I've ever been told. And 
it's going to take a while <laughs> to get through this. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's where the difficult part is with horses, like especially when you're working with, okay, like here's a horse that you once had that you had issues with um, and mm. rode in a certain way. Okay, now you've got to take, okay, what you've been doing for potentially years and years and years and change that like that because yeah. your horse has gone through this big change with someone else. And I think people forget and they're really hard on themselves that. Yes, they are. They're learning too. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I always tell people that like your horse in unlearning his muscle memory patterns had a complete support team. We had a vet out here. I had a nutritionist design my program. I have body work materials. I have body workers. I mean, a whole group of people were here to help your horse change their muscle memory. You only have me and you, yeah. I don't have the ability for you to get body work and chiropractic, although I recommend you do, but like, it's just yeah. me and you. So you're working really hard to do the hardest thing. Yeah. And our big brains, our big frontal lobes are like in the way of changing because we really like patterns and we really like some, you know, habits and we have a way of making patterns subconscious. So it's not even like when I tell people like your right hand is pulling, most people don't even believe me because I know that they think that they aren't yeah. because most people don't pull consciously. It's no. such a habit now that it's below the ability to be aware of. And that, that's the hard part is you have to bring all those up. And then you have to deal with people starting to feel bad about themselves and feel like they're a horrible rider and they're a horrible person. And look what I did to my horse. And so, mm. you know, in a perfect world, if I could, I would have a therapist, a doctor, a nutritionist, or like all of that team for the person to help them yeah. get through that. Cause yeah, it's hard. Yeah. I, yeah, there's so much that goes into it. And I think, yeah. And people are so hard on themselves through that transition because they just assume that you should get it, I think. And that, yeah, yeah. Smooth, especially when the horse goes through such a huge transformation, you'd probably see them and be ecstatic being like, oh my God, my yeah. horse is going amazing. And then realizing, holy shit, like, yeah, I have contributed to so much of their problems in the past. And I'm going to potentially take them back there if I don't change. Like, that's yeah. a lot yeah. to carry. It's hard. It's really hard. And, and I hope that people can really get a handle on not feeling so bad about themselves because this is not commonly found in the horse world. It's not like they heard it and were like, oh no, I hate my horse. I'm going to go screw him up. Cause that's, you know, most people have never, most people are so shocked that they've never thought about it that way. And it sounds so obvious when you hear it, but yeah. I didn't know it either. I was doing stuff that I I'm horrified by. But I was doing what I thought was the nicest thing available at the time. When I look back at the way I rode back then, I'm like, oh, that's awful. I know. But it just, it's not easy to find this stuff. You know, it wasn't available. I just by pure luck stumbled upon it and started to go deeper into this little rabbit hole. But- yeah. And I think it's good that there are like with social media and things like that, it's making it a little bit easier for people to find. And mm-hmm. I think, like you said, a lot of this stuff, it is so logical and so obvious when you explain it in that way. It's just like, why haven't people, why weren't we taught this 20 years ago? Like, or longer, do you know what I mean? Like no one seems well, to have questioned why. I was literally, it. yeah, I was literally taught to kick my horse in the stomach when putting the cinch on when I was a kid. Like that's how far we've progressed from just 20 years ago. Yeah, That's what I was working on as a kid and crying my eyes out while doing it. And everybody that was teaching me was like, you got to do it if you want to ride. So it wasn't around. When I was a kid, if you even thought about a horse having a feeling they would call you a pansy and laugh you out of the riding school yeah yeah so, yeah. this is all it's old this is all old old but it's still in a way it's very new yeah absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. and that stuff is still being taught in a lot of places today yeah absolutely and, and still being like um oh, it's still being championed as well by a lot yeah. of people because it's very yeah. confronting i think when you look at it from the horse's perspective, it's very confronting when you open your eyes up to that. And I remember like when I first realized, oh, my horse doesn't want to like be caught because maybe he doesn't like what I'm doing with him. That took me probably a year to wrap my head around before I was open to actually looking at addressing that on a root cause level because it it (laughs) was really uncomfortable. I was like, this hurts. This hurts my feelings short. I love him. Like this isn't the way it is. And it's just like, actually, no, like he doesn't want to do it. <laughs> like yeah. 
do it. It's so much easier to think about like what method of training I need to apply to get him caught instead of why doesn't I, why doesn't he want to get caught? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, so I think it's, it's a really interesting, but I, I do feel like, well, do you feel like there's a change in kind of, I guess, consciousness levels around people with horses and evolving to this stage? Because I feel like there are a lot of particularly um, that middle-aged women kind of age mm-hmm. bracket that are like, mm-hmm. I'm in a stage where I I'm worried about getting hurt. I really mm-hmm. respect my horse and I want to do things in a way that feels good for both of us. And I don't feel confident enough to push them through these things. And mm-hmm. I, I really feel like those groups of people are a real driver towards doing things in a real softer, in a much softer way, because they can't do it the other way, because if they get hurt, they've got kids to look after and things like that. Oh, like sure. You know what I mean? I think that uh, middle-aged women are not quite aware yet of, and I hope they become aware of the f- power they have in the equine industry because they drive the equine industry. And that's one thing that makes me crazy when I see these clinicians treat them with such disrespect is these women are our bread and butter. They are the majority of my uh, client base. They're the majority of all of our client base and disrespecting that client base and making unsafe that client base is just bad business. Yeah. And the, fa- the aside from being nasty behavior, um, mm. the fact that they haven't risen up in rebellion and overthrown these clinicians is just like, <laughs> I hope it's just a matter of time because uh, they have the majority of our income is where they come from. So, yeah. 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 I, and I think as well, looking at it from a, a standpoint of going, okay, there's this group of people, um, they've also got kids as well. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. they've got a generation that they're bringing through. So it's not just Mm -hmm. like one person that you're working with. It's potentially two or more. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting, the dynamic behind it all, but I really do hope that they're, I think with more awareness and more power too, because I feel like a lot of people, once they hear this sort of um, more logical, softer way of training horses and approaching horses, it's almost like this huge validation of what people have already been feeling for ever um yeah and then like you can't look at things other ways like I've had some clients that they're like I'm going to go to a lesson with my young horse but I know that it's 45 minutes but I'm going to say to them straight away like I only want to do 20 minutes because this horse only needs 20 minutes and I'm like go you Mm -hmm. like good on you yeah (laughs) yeah I'm starting to encounter more women who are starting to tell trainers what they want and I'm really proud of that um yeah you know I had this interesting conversation with somebody once because he it was a a wife and husband and they were asking why I wasn't, whether I was worried about driving away the like young male uh, community in terms of riding, because they said like so many of my posts are geared toward women. And so many of the things are all these women involved and all this feely, feely stuff, scaring off all the men. And I, at first I was like, feelings are not for just women, like feels feelings are for everyone. But second of all, if I'm like, if I were to go after the crowd of, of men, let's say that are afraid of feelings, let's say that's a hypothetical group of people. Um, that's the wrong crowd. That's like 5% of the equine industry anyway. Why would yeah. I go after the 5% when I have a middle-aged woman and her daughter and her daughter's daughter is three in one who are willing to work really hard and learn and invest time and invest energy and invest money and really do some good for the horse world. So like, yeah, obviously I'm not anti-men. I'm I'm more than happy to teach, but, but, but it's like, I'm not going to change the message to cater to people who are not on board with the way I think, I think this is the way things are going. So hop on board or see you later. Absolutely. And I think if you were to pivot your messaging to target those types of people that quite frankly, don't want to change at this point in time, Um, then that's a disservice to what you do. You know what I mean? Like you're better off going, okay, these are the people I can help. And then there's going to be someone that comes along that, or there probably already is out there, someone that has been through the same struggles as that those people have. And then they're the best person to help those people make that change. And that's Mm -hmm. amazing. Um, So, yeah, no, I think that's really, really cool. All right. What is, um, what is... What do you think the, oh, oh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. What do you think the like future of the equestrian industry, what are your predictions? 
Well, knowing human nature, I think that the pendulum tends to swing in from an extreme to an extreme. So, you know, things have gone like the old, old way where you sacked out horses. And I think things are pivoting into a really nice new direction. I don't I hope this isn't the case, but I just sometimes wonder if it isn't going to go to the opposite extreme Mm -hmm. where, you know, I, I get a lot of people who are so into their horse's feelings and being kind and caring that they accidentally go overboard where the horse says, no, I don't want to get caught. So they don't catch the horse or the horse doesn't like shots. So we don't do shots or he can't stand for trims. We don't do trims. Mm. Um, I have a feeling that we're going to deal with some period of time with going to that extreme. Mm. Uh, and then maybe it'll kind of come back to maybe a little bit more balanced place. Mm. Maybe not, but that that's the way that I think I see the trend going is a little bit toward the, um, extreme opposite yeah and I know for me personally like I sort of my horsemanship journey has been quite condensed but um I went okay traditional horsemanship doing all of that then I found out about positive reinforcement and then I was like Mm -hmm. oh my god I can't ride my horse (laughs) Mm -hmm. I can't do anything oh my god like and overanalyzed the shit out of it um and I think a lot of people get stuck in that space where they find things like that and maybe take things out of context and then end up in a situation where they're like, I don't want to do anything because I'm worried that I'm going to offend my horse. I think that's just human nature. I honestly think that's an important part of development is to go from extreme to scream and start to kind of find the middle. Yeah, that's so true. I like that you, I like that you mentioned that because I think in both phases for me personally, there was something that didn't feel quite right. And then mm-hmm. you've got to get to that phase, like you said, that middle ground where you're actually like, okay, what is my truth? And what, do, what are my mm-hmm. beliefs around this situation? What feels right for me? And then you can sit yep. there and then you can ebb and flow. So I think that's cool. What are your I thoughts? I think part on- of, you go. sorry, go ahead. I was just huh. going to say, I think part of growth is where you have to be like uncomfortable enough in what you're doing to seek something else out. And if, yeah. if you're just hanging out in the same space and you're like, this is fine, there's no motivation to grow. So if you happen to go to the outside extreme, at some point you're going to become uncomfortable with your work and kind of be forced through that pressure to find another alternative way of working. So I honestly think it's, it's a good thing in the long term. I mean, in the short term, it's not always good, but in the long term, in terms of people learning and growing. Yeah. I'm not that concerned by it. I mean, maybe there'll be some horses that don't stand for the farrier for a little while, but I personally would rather see that than horses getting dumped around. So that's very true. Very, very <sighs> true. What was my other question? Oh, it's escaped me. Um, yeah. I interrupted you in the thoughts. No, I've got it. <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts on positive reinforcement? You know, I don't know enough about it to mm-hmm. give a great educated answer. Oh. Um, but I will say the type of work that I do really focuses on flow of movement. And Mm -hmm. so I haven't found a way to integrate it in my work without interrupting the flow of movement. So for an example, um, I have a student who does positive reinforcement and I've been teaching her postural rehab techniques for, with her horse. Mm -hmm. And so here's a really great example, because we were talking about using movement itself to release the horse. So the movement is the release, whereas a, a negative reinforcement, you get the release after the movement and positive reinforcement, you get the the reward after the movement too. Um, So you're using the flow of movement to release the horse's body. And so we're talking about developing postures as a dynamic um, Mm. movement based type of thing. And so she was asking me what type of posture to reward with the treat. So when the horse lifts his shoulders, do I reward the posture? Mm. And I said, it's not that simple because you need the movement to determine the posture as it changes. So it's going to be dynamic all over the place. So it's not a static, like change, move, reward, change, move, reward. It was more like a dance where the reward is you and the horse moving together. So I can't say that I like or dislike it because I'm not educated enough on it. And I only have my own experience of what I've seen, but I haven't had, I haven't found a place for it in what I'm doing yet. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And, um, I heard, um, oh, what's her Panther flows. I'm trying to think of her actual name anyway she talks a lot about using um intrinsic motivation using movement Mm -hmm. to motivate the horse and use looking at Mm -hmm. the releases through that so that makes that makes complete sense and i guess like empowering the horse to feel good through the movement as well Mm -hmm. um, and Mm -hmm. finding release within the movement rather than the release always at the end of the movement like you were just saying exactly 
Yeah. So it's like, once I bring my horse to shoulder in, they find the stretch in the outside of the body is so wonderful that that is the reward that they are motivated to seek that movement because it feels good, but there's never a hold of that movement. It's dynamic and flowing. So to me, it would be like dancing with a partner and just having this wonderful, connected, fluid, rhythmic experience, but stopping them in the middle to give them a reward. It it, it almost breaks it up and interrupts the flow and it can almost, um, it can almost make it not as pleasant yeah and I guess yeah I guess with positive reinforcement what they would traditionally do is shape it out so like ask for like Mm -hmm. a little bit click and treat ask Mm -hmm. for a little bit more click and treat but I guess in your if you look at it if a horse is offering multiple steps and they're kind of in that flow or they've unlocked a certain part if you block them like by just Mm -hmm. clicking early then you could potentially be limiting the capacity where they're feeling that release in their own body yeah it's it's more like a yoga flow where each time you go up and you go down, you're finding a different posture Mm. and it's so dynamic that it actually should not be limited to a set posture. So you actually can't really even teach postures. Um, And this is a fun thing to get into debate to with between German and French classical. If you really want to ruffle some feathers and get everybody mad at me, um, I, (laughs) I don't teach postures as a unit. I teach movement in flow. So Mm -hmm. even ideally good postures like pull high and shoulders straight. I don't teach those at a standstill because posture is dynamic and posture requires, uh, posture is dictated by the movement the horse is in. So Mm, that's true because of the way the energy is flowing through their body Mm -hmm. it's going to be different every time so there isn't even an ideal posture to teach Mm. Mm, interesting (laughs) what is there's um, like ideal like philosophies and frameworks we want to go to but yeah yeah okay what is let's just say there's someone that let's just say they're in australia and they've got a horse Mm -hmm. that they um either I have a young horse or a horse that they're wanting some help with because they're struggling with, what are some characteristics that you would recommend them look for in a trainer to help them? Uh, well, you've got Manola Mendez down there, don't you? Yes. Well, I don't know a lot about him, uh, but <laughs> let's see you. If I were to take my horse to a trainer, I would want somebody who treated all horses with respect. I would watch them for a whole day or maybe two days. And Mm -hmm. see how they treated the big horses, the expensive horses, the cheap horses, the Mm -hmm. scraggly horses, the ugly ones, the pretty ones. I would see how they treated every one of them and how Mm -hmm. they talked about them. Mm -hmm. And then I would watch how they fed their horses and did their chores. And um, that, because that kind of stuff means a lot to me because anyone can be well-behaved for an hour or two when you have a potential client watching. Yeah. Um, But who you really are comes out when you think nobody's important anymore. Yeah. So that's what I would do. And I would want to watch them ride young horses because there are a lot of really talented riders. That doesn't mean that they're good young horse trainers because riding a young horse is not just like riding an older horse. So that's what I would want to do is I would really want to go out and feel it out and investigate. Yeah. And I would, I would be not afraid to ask questions. I love that because I think a lot of people are scared to do that. Yes. Yeah. There's kind of a, pedestal that trainers are put up on. And I think a lot of people are afraid to ask stupid questions or come across like they're challenging a trainer or mm-hmm. look like they don't know everything. Or I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. I've certainly felt all of these, those things myself with other clinicians I've taken clinics mm-hmm. with. So I honestly, I just think that the, the whole thing needs to be flipped on his head. Like I said, middle-aged women rule the world. So <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Ask questions. Your money. For me, if I had someone being like, like show that amount of dedication to wanting to have the best outcome for their horse and ask lots of questions, I would be like, go you. I know they're going to be a great client. When people come and do that, I'm thrilled. Please watch me because everything I do means something. I'm feeding your horse this way on purpose. I'm cleaning your stall this way on purpose. I'm Mm -hmm. leading your horse this way on purpose. I'm not doing anything just to get it done. I'm doing it for your horse. So I want you to know about it. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And I guess the other thing that I would add to that, and I'm curious to hear your opinion, is to talk to students of that trainer as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, because I think a lot of people yeah. go, that looks amazing, like they look like they do amazing work, um, but if you actually speak to people that have ridden under them, like how much progress have they actually made in X amount of time? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Hmm. Cool. Um, and what advice would you give to your younger self? 
Oh gosh. I wish I could go back to my younger self and tell younger me to have a backbone and just stick it out because I was so eager to really make a dent in the horse world. And I think that I, for a long time, really let, uh, other people dictate how my work should be or, or what I should be like. Um, and I wish I had, I wish I had started getting a little more self-confidence a little sooner mm-hmm. and broke out of the mold a little sooner. Um, mm-hmm. I would have avoided a lot of injuries. That's for sure. Um, mm-hmm. so I would tell my younger self to really, really trust what my gut was saying and just stick it out that it, it's going to be rough, but stick it out and it'll, it'll matter someday, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And what is your equestrian perspective or a core message that you would like to share? Well, my, um, my, I don't know what you call those three words. My, like my little motto is balance, trust, and respect. Um, and I like to think of those three words in everything I'm doing because I want balance in the horse's body and balance between work and play balance between left and right balance between top and bottom balance in their diet. Everything is balance related. Mm-hmm. Um, and then trust is so important to me because if I don't have the horse's trust, I can't begin to mm-hmm. teach him how to do, um, postures that are healthy for his body. Um, I want my clients to trust me. I want the horse to trust me. I want to trust myself. So, and then lastly, respect everything to me is about respect for the horse. Absolutely. Everything in my program revolves around respecting the horse's true nature. So that means things like giving them turnout with forage instead of putting them in a stall to make it more convenient for me or showing when it isn't going to be good for their body or their mind at that time. That's, those are the three tenets of everything that I do. And I actually have a big poster in my barn that says those things. I have to look up at it when I'm doing something and be like, Oh, I need to adjust, you know, the trust part because Mm. giving a horse this vaccine and he's getting scared and I need to slow down and stuff like that. I love that. And I find it interesting as well that you use the word respect in your three words, because I know that's a bit of a, an interesting word in the horse world, because often like, I guess old school days, you'd make sure the horse is respecting you all of those sorts of things yeah. so yeah do you come across or oh, I guess you probably wouldn't come across people that would assume that from you based on everything else that you share but well yeah. I actually used to I actually used to think oh, really? of of t- mutual respect was what I used to oh, yeah. um call it and then I started to understand more that that's not even in the horse's ability to comprehend mm-hmm. um so then I I learned a lot and I was so grateful for that information because I I like to think that I was never over dominating but I just mm-hmm. thought like you respect me I respect you mutual to a respect blah 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 and and now I see how anthropomorphic that is that's not even possible it's completely up to me to respect the horse um yeah. it's up to them only to be a horse it's completely up to me to respect their nature and guide them through their mm-hmm. life in a respectful way so i kept the word because i still think respect is extremely important yeah but now i've just pivoted its meaning to being the human's responsibility yeah i love that cool um and where can people find more about you well, I have a website. It's amyskinnerhorsemanship.com. Um, and then my Facebook is Amy Skinner Horsemanship as well. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I have a Patreon. Um, I don't know how to give you the link on this. I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> okay. okay. I think that's about it. I've got a blog. I've got a bunch of stuff. I'm here or there everywhere. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I've really enjoyed it. And I think it will hopefully empower a lot of people listening to this podcast to just follow what feels right for them and feel okay, like standing up for what you believe in and seeking out the type of education for yourself or your horse that you, you really desire. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. Cool. Well, I will chat to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Equestrian Perspective podcast. If you really enjoy it, please hit subscribe on the podcast so you can stay up to date with every episode that gets released. And also, if you want to share it around, please do so. Tag me on social media at Felicity Davies with an underscore at the end. And if you have any recommendations for episodes or guests that you would like me to interview on the podcast, please let me know via social media or if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to chat and I'm here for you whenever you need. So thank you for listening and I will see you in the next episode. Bye.